During the next half hour, we'll talk with Nevermind's producer, now garbage drummer, Butch Vig. Jonathan from Sub Pop called up and said, you know, they're going to be as big as the Beatles. And I'm like, yeah, right, I've heard that before. <laughs> that is not going to happen. And we'll hear from Nirvana fans Liam Howlett. All of a sudden, this record came out and smacked you in the face. And then I had to buy the album and just was blown away every track. And Noel Gallagher. Never mind. It's the only record that's ever got close to sounding like Nevermind the Bollocks. In early 1990, with drummer Chad Channing and still signed to Sub Pop, Nirvana set to work on the follow-up to their debut album Bleach with producer Butch Vig. Vig had worked on several records for Sub Pop. He produced Tad and singles for Sonic Youth and The Smashing Pumpkins. I got sent a copy of Bleach about two weeks before they came to our studio in Madison. And uh, the only song I'd heard on the radio, on the local like alternative radio, was uh, School, which is kind of very punky. And, uh, and I must admit, I wasn't that impressed when I heard the record, except for the song about a girl, which to me sounded like a Beatles song. I mean, it sounded like John Lennon could have written it. They were coming out to do uh, some recordings for Sub Pop that at the time were supposed to be an album. And then, of course, they got into a bidding war, and, and the stuff that we did was primarily used for demos. But, and then that got bootlegged all over the place, too. But I remember putting it on and listening to it with some friends and going, that's all right, there's a pretty cool vibe here. I, I thought Kurt had an amazing voice. That was the one thing that really struck me as being the most original thing on that record, and the, and the passion. By early 1990, there was an increasingly cool punk scene happening throughout the major cities in the States. Washington had been a centre of hardcore punk since the 80s, but Minneapolis, Chicago, San Francisco, and most notably Seattle, were all creating a stir. And on the basis of word of mouth, Bleach, and their stunning live performances, there was already a buzz going around about Nirvana. Butch Vig. I remember the Sonics told me about uh, Nirvana, said they're a great band, and Jonathan from Sub Pop called up and said, you know, they're going to be as big as the Beatles. And I'm like, yeah, right, I've heard that before. <laughs> that is not going to happen. Of the reasons that made Nirvana stand out, it was their strong sense of melody that separated them from many of their punk rock peers. Amid the noise and the turmoil of the songs, there was a subtlety and an ear for a tune, much of which came from Kurt Cobain's own record collection. Producer Butch Vig obviously spent a lot of time in the studio with the band. Kurt was fairly obsessed with trying to write a, a great hook. I mean, he would sit around even you know before we'd start doing a take and start noodling on the acoustic guitar and I would constantly go, whoa, what's that? Because he'd be playing some chord progression, some melody, and it always sounded amazing. And a lot of times then he would try to squash that, you know, because he had to stay within the, the punk ethic. I think that they really wanted to be R.E.M. You know, he, he loved the Beatles, and I think of the contemporary bands out there, he really respected R.E.M. And probably the Pixies, too. I think that was for more of the, the punk angle. During a tour of the Midwest, Nirvana had six days off, Sub Pop, anxious to hear new material, booked them into Vig's Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. There was no pressure on, you know, they were, they were just making a, a quick record for Sub Pop, and the recordings actually went pretty quickly. And uh, there was some tension at the time with between Kurt and Chad, the, the drummer at the time. I think that he wasn't particularly happy with everything that Chad was doing. Sometimes I remember Kurt would get behind the kit and, you know, try to show him play more like this, and Kurt wasn't particularly a good drummer, but... Other than that, the sessions, I think, went pretty well. I mean, we, we cut about six or seven songs. Pay to Play from the original 1990 sessions later evolved into Stay Away on the finished Nevermind. Anton Brooks was Nirvana's press officer from the very early Sub Pop days. Kurt sent him a copy of the Butch Vig tape. I remember having this conversation with Kurt. And he was telling me he had these uh, pop songs. Um, they were going to be chart hits. They, they, they were going to be number ones. And he sent me this tape. And what it was, it was a copy of Bleach. And it had sellotape over the, the holes at the top. And he'd recorded things like Sliver and Dive, In Bloom, uh, Lithium, and a few more tracks. And halfway through something like Lithium, you had to turn it over to get the other side. I, I remember thinking, uh, wow, these are amazing. I've heard some of the Sub Pop tapes, and despite being gritty and poorly copied, they sounded at the time like nothing else coming out of America. The arrangements alone set them apart from their grungier counterparts like Mudhoney and Tad, though it was Mudhoney who was still the more popular group at the time. This was the point where, behind the scenes, Nirvana were laying down the foundations for their future success. 
Meanwhile, two major things had happened to Nirvana between that initial session with Butchvig back in 1990 and when they began to record Nevermind in May 1991. Firstly, drummer Chad Channing was sacked. The band went through a series of temporary drummers, including the Melvins, Dale Crover, and Mudhoney's Dan Peters. But it was while in San Francisco that Kurt and Chris saw hardcore band Scream play live and caught sight of their future drummer, a long-haired skinny kid called Dave Grohl. Secondly, Nirvana had started including some of their new songs in their live set, and the Butch Fig sessions were soon being touted around other labels. Island Records in the UK were amongst the chasing pack, but on the 30th of April 1991, Nirvana officially signed with Gary Gersh of Geffen. Geffen didn't offer the most money, but they allowed the band to negotiate themselves into a strong contract, where they had total artistic control, and they got to share a label with mentors Sonic Youth. Nirvana were bought out of their sub-pop contracts, and soon after signing with Geffen, they were back in the studio with Butch Vig. We went to Los Angeles. Uh, I booked a studio out there, Sound City, which is out in the valley, um, just primarily because it had a great Neve board. It was a really big live track and a very, very no-frill studio. The, the day before we went out there, I got a tape in the mail that the band had recorded on a boombox, and it had some of the songs that were going to appear in the record, some of the new songs, like uh, Come As You Are... Uh, Teen Spirit was on there, and, and the boombox has its, these built-in mics, and they distort so bad that the whole thing was unbelievably distorted. So if you listen to that, you could kind of hear a little bit of the hooks and things. And I could hear the, hello, hello, how low, you know, I could hear a little bit of that, and hear the riff and come as you are. And between the songs, they were goofing around going, how's that sound, Butch? And they, this is Dave, and then Dave would play like a really sloppy drum solo. And then Kirk called me that night and said, we have the best drummer in the world. You know, we finally found the best drummer in the world, I swear to God. And, of course, I'm going, uh-huh, I've heard that before. <laughs> but I could tell he was really happy because he was always complaining that they wanted someone who was really solid tempo-wise but also hit the drums really hard. And Dave was both of those. I mean, just an amazing drummer. And, and Dave was also great to have around because he immediately loosened everything up. He was so engaging personality-wise. And But uh, they were having a, a really good time. We, when we went in and started tracking the first day... Uh, I could tell that uh, the vibe was pretty cool. They were pretty excited about it. Nirvana's first album, Bleach, was made with sub-pop producer Jack Endino for the legendary sum of $606.16. Things were a little different for Butch Vig with Nevermind. I think our budget was about $60,000, which to me, again, was, was fairly extravagant because most of the records I've been doing were $3,000 or $5,000. And up until then, the only thing that, that I'd actually been able to spend more time on was Gish, with the pumpkins, which I did right before, never mind. There was no real blueprint for producing this kind of record. Although there was a strong underground scene, and bands like Sonic Youth, Husker Du and Dinosaur Jr. had all signed to major labels, nothing had actually broken through to the mainstream in the States. Butch Vig. I just felt like I was kind of doing what I'd been doing for the previous years up to that, just making these punk records and trying to make them sound good, you know, fairly focused and, and get good performances out of the band. And, and I remember I went in and met with... Um, Gary Gersh at, uh, at Geffen at the time, who was their a and and he also said, you know, they can be as big as they want to be. You know, they just have amazing songs. You just have to make sure you get capture their performances. And that, that was the hardest thing was probably just getting Kurt, motivating him to, to push him a little bit, to make him push him beyond where he thought he could go because a lot of times he would want to do things once and it may not have been his best performance. And so he had to figure out a way to get him to do a better vocal take or to go back and play a guitar part and try to make it to sound better or locked in with a band better or come up with a, a little melodic thing that maybe sits in the track better. And I didn't really do a whole lot of um, arranging of the songs. I mean, the band had been you know, playing the songs well enough so they were pretty tight. Uh, the rock tracks on the record were, were fairly easy to do. Uh, Lithium uh, was a little bit of a struggle because they kept speeding up for some reason from where the tempo started out and it didn't it wasn't a good speed up sometimes it's cool if tracks take on a, a, an edge as the as the song develops but in this particular case uh, it just started losing the groove so uh, we just we suggested a click track for Dave and he was like I don't know if I've ever played with one and, and you know which can totally screw people up but he was amazing at it. he just put it on and went oh, I can play with this and and, and they did it a couple takes with it and, and he nailed it But it was teen spirit that really made Butch Vig take notes. I mean, I knew it right away. It, uh, 
in, even in rehearsals, when, when they started playing it, you know, this is when Kurt said we have the best drummer in the world, and they'd set up in this big room, and the guitar and bass rigs were so loud, so unbelievably loud. And Dave didn't have any mics or anything on him, and the drums were equally as loud in the room. And I, and I remember literally standing up, starting to sweat, and pacing around the room because the song was so powerful and so amazing and so hooky. And, you know, not in my head thinking that it was it's going to be this massive track, but just thinking it's it's one of the standout tracks, the most one of the most important tracks on the record. And I didn't even know what Kurt was singing at that point, you know, and I couldn't really even tell until he got in the studio and I could actually hear clear what was coming through the microphone. You just knew that it had something going on, uh, an intensity in it, and, uh, and that was coming through in their playing as well as his singing. During the recording of Nevermind, the band worked eight to ten hours a day, and in between takes, they played covers by bands like Black Sabbath, Aerosmith and Alice Cooper. The sessions were going well. Territorial Pissings, for example, was recorded in just one take. But there were still bad days. The day we caught Lithium, trying to get that the, the groove on that, uh, I mean, it frustrated Kurt really bad. And after we got the track, I remember he went in and he was, he kind of went and sat in the corner and didn't say anything for about a half an hour. And I remember sometimes I would have to go up to Chris, you know, who I think knew him best, and say, Chris, is, is Kurt okay? And he said, he's okay, just leave him alone for a while. He'll, he'll snap out of it. And then... He went, walked back into the studio, and they started playing that jam that became uh, Endless Nameless. And just, you know, I was like, roll the tape. And you could tell he was really pissed about something. I mean, it was scary to see because the, the veins in his neck were literally popping out. He was screaming so hard. And in the middle of the song, he totally smashed his guitar up. And, and I started freaking out because that was the only left-handed Mose right that he had, which is the main guitar that he played on the record. And, uh, of course, then he kept going, and it wound down until they had trashed everything. In contrast to the anarchic Endless Nameless, Nevermind also had its starker moments. Polly, one of the most chilling Cobain songs on Nevermind, was in effect a step on from tracks like About a Girl on their previous album, Bleach. Stripped down and bare, it's both powerful and vulnerable, an effect that wasn't easy to achieve. Sometimes the quiet songs are more intense than the than the songs that roar. And Kurt had that way when he brought his voice down, this intensity came out that, that sometimes became almost scary. And that song was actually recorded at, at Smart, at uh, our studio in Madison, and uh, really quickly. And uh, I know that Kurt kind of got a little upset sometimes playing it because it almost became a, a punter's anthem but I don't think that everybody quite understood what the lyrics were about and we actually thought about trying to record that again and make it sound better quote unquote but uh, there was a certain quality and a darkness that I think we captured the very first time we did it so we left it as is on the album I'm, I'm glad we did Only wants a cracker Maybe she would like some Wants a man Myself. Of all of Butch's memories about working on Nevermind, this was his most outstanding recollection of the sessions. Probably the hardest track to record on the record is the last track, uh, Something in the Way. Um, we tried to cut it as a band, and Kurt had this old five-string acoustic guitar that he carried with him that he never tuned the guitar, or never changed the strings, never tuned it. It kind of sounded the way it did unto itself, so it Chris would have to tune to that, and, and it had a, almost a plinky ukulele sound, really. It was very, very lo-fi sounding. And he was trying to play that out in this big live room with a mic on it and with the band playing it, and it just did not, it wasn't grooving. They couldn't lock in, and the feel was all wrong, and, and I could see that uh, Kurt was getting really frustrated, and it looked like he was going to explode again. He just, like, he was starting to seethe a little bit. I suggested that he comes into the control room, and and just kind of explains to me how he hears it in his head. And he sat down on the couch and started playing it really quietly, really understated. I could barely even hear the notes, and he was whispering the the lyrics. And I was like, okay, stop, don't just stay right where you are. And I turned everything off in the room, the fans, I shut the telephones off, and we put a mic on him, on the acoustic and, the, and his voice. And I sent a message out to the lobby and said, don't anybody come in or bother us here. We're recording in the control room. And, and then he recorded that there, and I literally felt like I had to hold my breath for three and a half minutes or whatever while he sang it. That's the whole basis of the song, you know, just that, that intimacy. I mean, that song, in a way, I think Kurt kind of felt like there were parts of it that almost could have been 
autobiographical, you know, the guy, the hermit living under the bridge and, you know, the outsider uh, who doesn't really feel like you can, you're not part of society. And it, it's just, you know, I knew that we needed to embellish the track a little bit more, but keep it fairly understated. So anyway, after getting the acoustic in his voice, then we went back and, and dubbed the bass and Dave went in and did drums last. And that was hard for them to do, too, because it typically used to play in as a band and then to have to go, and, and they had to play more with Kurt's acoustic feel, and there was no click track or anything. You know, it was very kind of push and pulley, so it took us a while to overdub those parts. Then we brought in a, a friend of theirs, a cello player, who put some kind of slidey, uh, creepy cello, cello parts on there. You know, sometimes when it's that understated and that quiet, it becomes one of the most uh, intense moments in the record. It's a... The recording of Nevermind took longer than expected. Butch wasn't happy with his mixes, and veteran producer Andy Wallace was brought in to mix the tracks. Just prior to the album being released, and the band's first Reading Festival appearance in August 91, Nirvana came to the UK to do promotion for Nevermind. It wasn't an easy job getting press for the band, but you have to put the summer of 1991 into context. The Raven Magister baggy scene still clung to the front covers of the music papers, while the mainstream charts were dominated by Cher, who topped the LP listings, and Everything I Do, I Do It For You by Brian Adams was number one in the singles chart from the middle of July through to the start of November. As a reaction to all this, however, there was a scent of change in the air. Audiences were getting younger, stage diving was the new rock and roll, and the appetite for a rocking guitar band was back on the agenda. At the same time, there was an increasing awareness of the underground groups coming from the States. There was this growing fascination with the American bands, a mindset which, put simply, suggested that Seattle was more sexy than Stourbridge. That said, Nirvana was still cult rock's best-kept secret at the start of 91. So by the time they arrived to play the Reading Festival that summer, it was clear that by word of mouth, their reputation had grown far beyond most people's predictions. Shortly after Reading, Nirvana's profile was set to increase again with the release of Smells Like Teen Spirit. But if the fans were catching on quickly, the single far outstripped their label's expectations. Kerrang editor, Phil Alexander. Certainly in, in the UK, no one at the label understood what Nirvana were all about. When uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit came into the uh, Geffen offices, I think they all sort of thought, oh, who's this curious little rock band from America, you know? The more people heard that record, the more suddenly they realised they had something really, really special. And I remember actually hearing somebody from the record company actually played me Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I remember just going, oh my God, this is just an absolutely classic rock song. And I think um, it was on a single track cassette, and we must have played that you know, just on repeat the whole time because it was just such an amazing song. Teen Spirit preceded the release of Nevermind by a couple of weeks. At the time, it was never meant to be the hit that it turned out to be. It was merely meant to pave the way for Come As You Are, which everyone thought was going to be the big hit single. Meanwhile, tapes of the album were starting to circulate. One of the journalists who had supported Nirvana throughout was writer Keith Cameron. It was a tremendously exciting moment when, that, when the tape of that record finally uh, arrived after so much anticipation. They were a world away, really, from the songs that had been on Bleach. That visceral power was still there. But Kurt Cobain had just started writing the most amazing pop songs. There was maybe one or two on the first album. This time, they were all amazing. And um, it was a quantum leap forward. Geffen certainly did underestimate the power of what they had with Nirvana. Initially, the label only shipped out 50,000 copies of the album. Nevermind debuted at 144 on the Billboard chart and did eventually go on to knock Michael Jackson off the number one slot. Back in the UK, it entered at 36 on the 5th of October 1991, but it took till February 1992 for it to reach its highest position at number seven. As the reviews came in, it was clear that Nirvana had made a record that appealed to fans old and new alike. Mind you, it was still a difficult time at the press. At NME, we reviewed Nevermind in the same week as Primal Scream's Screamadelica, a far more fashionable record at that point. Nevermind was relegated to the back pages of the review section, but luckily I can hold my hand up and say I did call it the big American alternative record of the awesome. Nirvana had struck all the right chords at exactly the right time. They were punk enough for the punks, and they were rock for a generation of rock fans who'd grown disillusioned with the excesses of the passing metal groups. They were also, much like the Manic Street Preachers in their own way, a confrontational antidote to the British music scene of the time. Manchester's partying baggy and acid scene and the withdrawn, more reserved shoegazing movement, including groups like Chapter House and Ride. Watching Nevermind's progress from the other side of the Atlantic was producer Butch Vig. I think every generation there all seems to be one type of record that really is a standout. 
that that uh, kind of defines a certain era, and, and that is definitely one of those records. I think at the time, because there was so much either really slick pop music on the radio, like CNC Music Factory or Madonna, uh, you know, uh, pop stars, or or like a lot of the metal hair bands, you know, which I guess at the time were like the big rock bands, like White Lion and Skid Row and and, and things like that, and never mind really. I had, I think, a lot more passion than than those. It sounded real. It sounded like something was exploding as you're listening to it. And that, a lot of that was the BAM. A lot of it was also from Kurtz, his singing and, and his persona. You know, it was very cathartic, almost what was what he what he's trying to get out of himself. And and that connected with a lot of kids. It, it's it doesn't happen that often. Nevermind captured the imagination of the British public, particularly, as Vig notes, the disenfranchised young music fans looking for something they could believe in. Mark Hamilton from Ash was one of those kids. Me and Tim were both at school when we were about 14 when Nevermind came out and I remember the initial buzz and the hype was just huge because it was this new band that just sort of exploded and Teen Spirit especially sort of turned a lot of you know kids onto it. I know there's a lot of bands from my town Probably about seven or eight bands formed simply on the back of just the van were a cool band and they just made us sort of think we want to do that as well. A lot of it had to do with the sound, you know, it was just powerful, powerful pop songs really. I think Kurt's voice was brilliant as well. He was a person who you could sort of relate with. But why hadn't people got into Mudhoney, Tad and even bands like Sonic Youth or the Pixies in the same way? Could it have been that Nirvana just sounded more human? Kerrang editor Phil Alexander... I think the difference between Nirvana and especially Nevermind when that emerged and the, the rest of the musical world at the time was the fact that it was a very honest record and it was a very emotional record. I mean, the emotions that were sort of being thrown up lyrically on that record were really hit a spot with a lot of people. I mean, it worked on a lot of different levels. It worked on a pop level, but it also worked on a, on a real sort of mental and sort of intellectual level. And, and for people that were maybe a bit more withdrawn, it was a great record to get into the lyrical side of things because you could sit there and you could hear Kurt singing about these kind of personal demons, really, for want of a better term. Teen Spirit went on to be voted Enemy Readers' Single of the Year and Nevermind was number one in the writers' top 50 albums of 1991. In the blurb, quoting from the original review, it ran, Nirvana have made an album which is not only better than anything they've done before, it'll stand up as a new reference point for the future post-hardcore generation. And it calls it, quote, a record for people who'd like to like Metallica but can't stomach their lack of melody. And for the record, I nicked that line from fellow Nirvana fan and now Radio 1 Breeze Block DJ, Mary Ann Hobbs. Credit where it's due. Funnily enough, though, we were both on the right lines. A while after the record came out, Kurt went on to say that Nevermind was closer to a Motley Crue record than a punk rock record. Producer Butch Vig. After they started having the success, I know that they sort of took a little bit of a negative attitude towards never mind thinking oh it's too slick it's too polished but i know that they were incredibly happy with the record we finished it but then when it blows up and becomes the biggest thing since swiss cheese it's like you have to in order to keep your punk uh, integrity you have to kind of diss it you know you have to go well you know we're we're really a punk band and uh, but kurt's songwriting instincts were much more pop i mean he he loved hooks he loved uh, uh, a great melody and, and he was amazing at putting a a structure and arrangement together and that a lot of times he did I think try to squash that a bit you know he tried to tried to deny that that's where he wanted to go but he was also a huge Beatles fan I mean a lot of times when I would go over and pick them up at the apartments um, you know take them in the studio they'd have Beatles records on that's what they've been listening to all night Nirvana's own eclectic taste has spawned a record which in turn would appeal to other bands right across the musical spectrum here's the prodigy's Liam Howlett wasn't into rock one bit you know I heard um, Smells Like Teen Spirit, and I thought, yeah, this, this has really got some balls, you know. All of a sudden, this record came out and smacked you in the face. And then I had to buy the album and just was blown away every track. Definitely overrode any memories of kind of six formers with sort of uh, leather jackets and greasy hair and Iron Maiden that I'd thought about before, you know, really. But I think Nirvana really captured the anger and the realness in, in their music, and you could really hear that, do you know what I mean, totally in the lyrics and... I just think it was just uh, such a totally real record. Maybe the true test of an album's greatness is how it sounds years after release. Nevermind still feels angry and sad and everything it first felt eight years ago. Why? Journalist Keith Cameron. I think it sounds great in hindsight for, for the reasons of 
songwriting prowess really I think it the sound of the record obviously was was replicated ad nauseam in the years to come it still be, it still is being in, in certain corners and I think if that's all the record had been about if the record had only been about a sound then I, I don't honestly believe it would have endured but the fact is that Kurt Cobain was writing the most amazing brutally simple pop songs he was writing beautiful songs you know he was writing funny songs he was writing really angry songs and they were all there on that record Never mind, to date has sold in excess of 14 million copies worldwide. It would influence an entire age group of music fans, many of whom would end up being in bands themselves. Spookily, crossing 15 years of rock history, the punk generation had Never Mind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols, and the post-punks and the slackers of Generation X, they simply had Never Mind. And whether you're a fan of Never Mind or not, the album's legacy will be with us for many years. Noel Gallagher. Never mind. It's the only record that's ever got close to sounding like Nevermind the Bollocks. I think it was the last the last great American record. Because that album came out before we had a record deal as well, and his melodies that he used to write over the music was a big influence on me. They were really pop. People think of it like it's a rock album, but man, it's, the, it's the biggest commercial pop album of the last 20 years. That. It's the greatest rock record since Nevermind the Bollocks. Without a doubt, the sound of it is fantastic. Butch Vig done a good job there. But the songs are brilliant. It's quite obvious to say Smells Like Teen Spirit. But I remember hearing that for the first time on the radio when I was working for the Inspiral Carpets in their office. And we used to have like the radio on, they come on for the first time and the whole place just went speechless. I was like, what was that? You know, you know, who's this band? I think it would have been the John Lennon of our generation. I think so. Unfortunately, we'll never know. But let's leave the last say about Nirvana and never mind to producer Butch Vig. I remember calling John Silva, their, their manager, and saying, is there any chance of this record actually going number one? He said, not a chance, because Michael Jackson and U2 were at the top of the charts, and the next week it went number one. John called back and said, I owe you an apology, and I'm going to send you a bottle of champagne. <laughs> then to see them on Saturday Night Live, and, uh, and I went and saw them in um, the Metro in Chicago, and I hadn't seen them for a couple months since we'd finished the record, and th there was such a buzz in the air. It was like Beatlemania. I mean, there was a line around the block, and and uh, I went in, and Kurt ran across and gave me a hug, and Dave came over and said he was tired of his drum kit, and I said, I want you to smash it up tonight. Your manager's here. He'll have to buy you a new one. And kidding, of course, and then, and then he, so he smashed his drum kit up. And, and they were, you know, they, they just totally seemed like uh, they were having a good time. They were caught up in the buzz. It was cool. People screamed the whole show. It, it literally was like Beatlemania. I could not believe it. And girls were crying down front. And I remember I had goosebumps during the show because I felt—I know this sounds ridiculous, but I felt like a proud father to a certain extent, being being in there and having just seen this thing kind of go from you know ground zero to to Nirvana. Yeah.